Regents Professor um, at uh, the University of Maryland, Chesapeake Biological Lab, uh, in, and he's a fisheries ecologist. And Dave and I, I think I started as a systems ecologist and moved towards fisheries, and Dave started as a hardcore fish guy and moved towards systems thinking, I guess you could say. So we're sort of somewhere in the middle. But I've known him. He was a tremendous help to me in my PhD, and he's been kind of a guide and mentor and friend. Sometimes, uh, you know, uh, we've had fun together too. Let me put it that way. Up in Nova Scotia, I think. I know Newfoundland it was. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Fredericton. Yes. Uh, anyway, um, so Dave is going to talk about migration of uh, fish. It's the uh, migra migration ecology of marine fishes. So I'm going to let you take that over, and I don't know if that's your first slide. Looks like it is. Yes. Thank you, um, and good morning. I knew this was going to be a bit of a film festival, so excuse indulge me as I, I try to proceed with multimedia. Let's see if this works. I'm already in trouble. Uh, okay. Now, where's my little... There we go. It's a little fanfare for you this morning. I'll browse you after that big social. Everybody awake? So here we are in the lower Potomac, Point Lookout, State Park, and we are doing our commodity tree painting on about 100 stretch guys. Not as slick a production as the river keeper, I'm sorry, we had just had a GoPro over there this morning. <laughs> suit your job, but home voyage. <laughs> well, people on the move, so that we can observe fish on the move. Here we are. Um, release fish of the Potomac. They're flitting around the Chesapeake, move through the C and D canal, some of them, into the Delaware, up off Long Island, and then heading up to Massachusetts. This is the span of about a month. And what we're seeing are telemetry receivers that are picking up these fish and they light up when the fish passes by. So you can see that Chesapeake striped bass do invade other waters and they are enjoyed by other states. Well, I want to thank President Lindbergh for her kind invitation to come. And um, I'm going to take a, uh -oh, take a chapter Take a chapter, take a mic. Um, I'm going to take a chapter, the final chapter, and talk about something I call contingents for contingencies. And as fishery scientists and managers and stakeholders, we deal with uncertain futures. These are our contingencies that we have to deal with. We may have some ideas on what those are, but we're always thinking about alternative contingency plans in our work. And I would like to suggest that diversity of migration behaviors that we see in the fish that we work on can provide something in our toolbox. We can provide a contingency reserve that we can draw upon for some of these unforeseen problems that arise, such as changes in the communities that we serve, such as global change ecology, global change climate. So I'm going to go through four case studies of some recent research that my lab has done to exemplify this point. So if we took that animation of the Potomac, the 100 Potomac striped bass moving in coastal waters, we can actually simplify that um, into, a, into this figure here, which shows that small fish, fish less than 80 centimeters total length, 
they tend to reside in the Chesapeake. And larger fish, greater than 800 centimeters, they move out in coastal waters. And this kind of dynamic's been known for a while. We're just basically refining this with our 100 uh, telemetered strike bass. But this maps very well on work that Bob DeRazio did with Kathy Hatal and Andy Kainley many years ago on conventionally tagged fish. Now we can look at this a little bit differently. We can talk about contingents. So we have different components of the population that have different migration behaviors. Here, one component of the small fish are staying resident in the Chesapeake. And you can see them here track for four years, 2014 through 2017, as the red dots as they move across day of the year. So we see the seasonally, those red guys, those small guys, they're staying put in the Chesapeake. And the blue guys, they're undertaking this very ordered coastal migration. And what's remarkable is they're all going to Massachusetts. For some reason, they like Massachusetts waters, and I'm sure it's reciprocated by the Massachusetts anglers. Um, and then you can see, interestingly, some of the fish that were originally small when we tagged them, they're now growing to a size where they're becoming coastal migrants. So that all makes sense. But think about the kinds of environments these two contingents are seeing. In the Chesapeake, they're seeing very different food web, they're seeing very different fisheries. We have very big commercial fisheries. And those commercial fisheries have different selectivities, uh, they're fishing in different manners. And in the coastal waters, we're talking about anglers and charter industries, and they're using this resource very different. So are there contingencies that we can work on, and why should we pursue that? Well, one way that we can look at the fate of these two different contingents and how they interact with fisheries, and this is just for our sample of tagged fish, is to look at how they're lost from our sampling frame. This is based on the last time we heard one of our telemetry fish. And we can construct catch curves, and you can see that the fish, the small fish that we release in fall in the Potomac River, they seem to be, the loss rate's much higher, presumably fishing rate's high, higher, than those that emigrate, those that release in spring and undertake coastal migration. So this alone gives reason that we may want to build assessments, sustainable sustainability frameworks differently for these two contingents. And ASNC has, in fact, done this. This is built in to their last benchmark, and we'll see what happens in the current benchmark, but the idea is that they're treating these two contingents. Contingent thinking is in their SOC assessment, their age structure assessment, and the idea being that the coastal contingent has a very different fishing selectivity, shown here, we're selecting the bigger fish, the bigger fish are more available according to that immigration schedule I showed you, than in the Chesapeake where we're targeting smaller. So ASMC is building that contingency into their management. What is the contingency? Well, we have strong year classes coming through. Which fishery is going to see it first? If we have poor year classes, which fishing fleet should we look at carefully time in terms of trying to conserve the spawning stock biomass? All right. Let's move to the Hudson River. And here I want to acknowledge Audrey Van Gennecht, and I believe she's here. She's giving a talk. Um, and uh, thank you. Nice to meet you, Audrey. And I, I, I'm, apology for not asking your permission to show your nice animation. But she took data that uh, she requested data, and she got inspired to create this animation. So see if we can get this one working. This one's really cool. Nope, didn't work. So okay. striped bass are moving into the Hudson River to spawn in spring. This is Audrey's own composition. She has a group, a jazz group, and you guys are so hip in New York. I'll tell you about it. These, these strike bass, they're getting busy, you know. Makes sense. They're in the group. So are people along the river. They're getting busy too. Um, assessment scientists, fisheries. Um, in any case, we're going to end up here, I think. And yes, so we're mid May. We're kind of halfway through the season. But look at the distribution of strike bass. They're using the whole river. That's really cool. That's very cool. That's a big river to find all these striped bass. So are they spawning everywhere? Well, it turns out if you look at the long-term ichthyoplankton survey that is very rich in data from the utilities, um, you find out that in most years, there's concentrations of spawning evidence from the uh, egg production and production of early larvae in the Saugerties Coxsackie region upriver and in the Highlands Newburgh area down there. This seems to be a fairly persistent pattern year after year. And I've always wondered, 
is this a conservative behavior in terms of what the spawners are doing? Do we, in fact, have spawning runs of Hudson River striped bass? We have an opportunity to look at this collaboration with Jess Best and Amanda Higgs, and I, I use that very large, writ large, because they did all the work. Thank you. They tagged all the fish for us, and they even indulged us by taking us out on their, uh, uh, their long-haul survey, which was just a riot. Um, <laughs> And uh, so I also want to acknowledge my assistant, Michael Bryan, who did this analysis. And so if you look at a spawning run, it's basically a time series. So we have two spawning runs in two years. We tagged these fish in 2016 just to exemplify this. The shape of these time series is dependent on when they come in the river, when they leave the river for spawning, and then how far they go up. And there's some other subtleties here. And so we employed a, a technique called um, dynamic time warping to try to adjust slightly these time series so that we could see if there were two dominant clusters to support the hypothesis. So we, we released fish in the lower part of the river and in the higher part, and we waited a year to see if they came back to those same areas. And if you need more explanation, explanation about time warping, um, well, it's just a step to the right. <laughs> So these are the, the dominant modes we observe, shown in black. It's our kind of central tendency behavior. And you can see that uh, we, 66 of the 80 fish that were tagged came back the first year, which is pretty good. And we do see a pattern. Uh, either the gray lines are the individual behaviors that we're, we're kind of getting a central cluster for. And uh, you can see that we have a group that does ascend higher in the river and another group that doesn't go as far. And further, the timing is different. The one that comes in uh, and goes farther up is coming in later and it stays later. That makes sense. It's colder up there uh, than the one that goes up just a little ways. And then further, we looked at it in 2018, we have 40 come back and we see those behaviors repeated. So these spawning behaviors do seem to be conservative year to year. Now the next question is, is the same individual doing the same thing? Is there spawning site fidelity? We did cross tabulation and indeed there is. There's evidence for that. So salmon have nothing on striped bass. Where's, where's <laughs> Okay, so not here. No, that's not true. I, but in any case, that is very. I think this is the first discovery of spawning runs for striped bass. I mean, maybe John, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, in any case, why might this matter? So we looked at what happens after these striped bass leave the Hudson. So we have these two spawning runs: one going up higher, the other you know, not going up as high. And there's regulations in the Hudson River. It seemed very wise regulations to me to conserve the great body of the spawners coming up. Those first spawning females and many age classes. And boy, if you can keep 40 inch, it would be a crime not to let you, if you get one, a crime not to let you keep it, I guess, if you like those trophy fish. So that's, that seems to be a good strategy. <coughs> but as soon as they leave the river, all bets are off. Now those are the sizes that are directly targeted. It's a gauntlet out there throughout southern New England. So those, those early the spawn fish, those that the river, the spawning run that doesn't go up as high, they're going to be subjected to this fishery, and lo and behold, you see that their loss rate is substantially higher, the lower spawning run, than the higher spawning run. So that may be important. It may be important as a contingency. Why would that be important? Well, these striped bass are spreading their offspring up and down this river, and that could be an important contingency in terms of stabilizing what kind of recruitment you get each year. All right, spawning contingents of striped bass, and for those cognizant of the term uh, contingent, it comes from Oscar Say, originally uh, used for Atlantic mackerel contingents. Spawning contingent in the Gulf of St. in the St. Lawrence River, or Gulf of St. Lawrence, and a spawning contingent uh, in spring in southern New England. These two contingents as adults mixed during spring and winter migrations. And so it was very hard to tease these out. SETI uh, figured this out by carefully looking at size distributions to see these pulses of different sized fish and said, oh, those are Canadian fish entering our US fisheries. We have two separate spawning areas, though. Genetics has failed to, 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 to decipher this further because there must be a high degree of mi mixing. But we thought we might try otolith microchemistry, and we used delta oxygen 18 isotopes, and there's this very clear latitudinal signal, uh, a nice paper by Clive Truman, 
that we should have expectations that if we're in U.S. versus Canada versus Northeast Atlantic, where there's a separate uh, Atlantic macro population, we should get elevated delta oxygen 18 as we move to those. And we that bore out. We carved out the, the natal region, the first year of life uh, for these otoliths. You can see that there. And we get this nice relationship. So maybe this is promising to begin to discriminate those, those uh, Northwest Atlantic contingents. But we did have a little bit of an issue. We had a strong interannual effect. These were Northwest Atlantic's very dynamic system, Labrador slope waters, Gulf of Mexico waters, or Gulf Stream waters mixing. And so you see this very strong annual signal, but the Canadian ones are in the uh, filled bars and U.S. in the uh, unfilled bars. And you can see we have a consistent difference as long as we do the comparison on a year class specific basis. So we did this, we constructed base <coughs> and we were able to discriminate um, for a sample of Atlantic, uh, Atlantic, there we go, Atlantic mackerel um, collected from U.S. fishing grounds, and we found that uh, using random tree forest analysis, uh, that for the first two years there was local retention of these Atlantic mackerel in their respective countries, but then thereafter, as they became adults, our U.S. fisheries were being heavily subsidized or almost completely subsidized by recruits from the northern contingent, from the Canadian contingent. So this kind of mixing uh, is, is, is very important in terms of assessing it, and all this work was very nice in that it was carefully aligned with the Atlantic Mackerel Benchmark Assessment out of the Northeast Fishery Science Center that just happened this past year. And Karen, this is, I love this, this is the first time I've seen this, like in the first paragraph of a, a benchmark assessment. It. Yay, we finally arrived. So, in any case, what this caused to happen is that we don't really know the source sink dynamics. We know that they're there. And with that contingency, that uncertainty, your best bet is to lump. And so this forced cooperation in force. We had great science cooperation between Canadian and U.S. scientists, uh, good leadership. And we combined egg ichthyoplankton data in both regions, in both spawning areas, and we came up with composite view of the health of this stock. The stock assessment held together it was the first time it passed peer review in over a decade. Um, and um, that's, that's good news. The bad news is the trend. It's clearly not a great trend for Atlantic macro. Okay, so to wrap up these first few examples, uh, for the contingency for striped bass has to do with fishing. Well, we don't know in terms of the future of fishing communities, fishing fleet behaviors, and the contingent status, which can change with things like year class strength. And the way that we can do this, at least ASMC, so is tailoring their assessments, their reference points, their control rules for each of these two contingents, Chesapeake and the coastal contingents. For the spawning runs, um, there's this idea that it's important to distribute your offspring. It's what I call spawning in the nick of time. And the response could be, and I certainly would not want to <laughs> argue this too strongly in this room, but you might want to look at this, uh, and that is tailoring fishing regulations so that you, you, you more equitably fish both of those spawning runs. The Atlantic mackerel contingents, when you don't know a lot, you know there's mixing going on, but you don't know a lot about the, the, the mix of that mixing, it's precautionary to do a lumped assessment and, and uh, reference points and control loops on the pooled resource. But I haven't said anything about global change. I'd like to turn to that theme now. And I'm going to talk about something called uh, evacuation or partial evacuation. So just like humans, the few studies have looked at this, and we've looked at it in the Hudson River with Irene and Lee coming through for striped bass. We saw it for striped bass. Humans, some will heed the warning and they'll get out of town, and others will hunker down. It turns out fish do the same thing. Some will evacuate, and some will hunker down, hunker down and weather the storm. The, the, the hurricane issue, we're going to look at in the Mid-Atlantic Bight. And the Mid-Atlantic Bight is, a, is really a huge shelf area that extends from Georgia's bank down to Cape Hatteras. And you can see our little corner of it in the black box where we've done telemetry work on black sea bass looking at their movement ecology 
we tag black sea bass, we surround them with telemetry receivers, and then we can look at their movement and evacuation behaviors. But let's return to this, this hurricane effect, just on the Mid-Atlantic Bight's oceanography. And you can see before the storm, very warm sea surface temperatures. Immediately after the storm, temperature, sea surface temperatures like almost 10 degrees cooler. Where did that cold water come from? It was always there. In the mid-Atlantic, we have summer water laying on top of winter water. And it stays like that all summer until the storms come up and mix it up. So this is a fairly dramatic process that happens every year. So my, my students tease me. This is a late career epiphany. Dave discovers the cold pool. That bottom layer of winter water is called the cold pool. And I just showed you a picture of the sea surface temperature. This is the bottom water temperature, just off Ocean City in 20 to 30 meters. So black sea bass are flitting around at 12, maybe 13, 14 degrees, they're perfectly happy. The water column gets mixed. We mix all that warm surface water, the cold water. We get 10 degrees in the span of six to eight hours. Um, I would say that's huge, right? It's, it's catastrophic change, 10 degrees. It's, to give you a reference point, it's the range of temperature between Hatteras and Gulf of Maine, happening right there in, in vertical relief um, off Ocean City. It's over half the range of temperatures that we'll see annually uh, at Ocean City. So it's a very large change, and it's a Q10 for those folks who are physiologists. It's a big deal. And how do fish respond to that? Well, they respond in two ways. Um, oh, this shows that it's, it's common to other years. So 2018, I'm sorry, the billboard's still up there. But um, you can see in 2018 a very similar event. And what you see in both 2016 and 2018, it precipitates fall turnover. So for those folks who work in lake systems, fall turnover is a big deal. This is, I think, really underappreciated for such a vast area. Fall turnover has to be a big deal here as well, in terms of precipitating things like seasonal migrations, food web changes, and so on. And this fish on the move, whether they're shellfish or anadromous fish, they're seeing this, right? They're seeing this. 2017, a different year, we have a kind of different disturbance schedule. We have a nor nor'easter that comes through, water column restratifies, and then we got other disturbance events before it completely, uh, the cold pool's completely mixed in. The black sea bass we tag, they evacuate. They show incomplete evacuations. The biggest evacuation we saw was 40% of the fish associated with hernine in 2016. But we, all, we see evacuations that are timed with the storm events in other years as well. So that's one kind of behavior they can do. The other behavior is they can hunker down. So these are, this way we measure this is how many times a, a sea bass is detected by a receiver in the span of an hour, a different receiver. And their activity levels change every year after a major wind or storm event. That, that could be a big deal because that affects things like their foraging, reproductive ecology. And in some years like 2016 and eventually 2007, those are permanent behaviors. They don't go back becoming, they don't recover from that. They hunker down permanently for the rest of the fall until they leave and go into deeper shelf waters. All right, so we have global change climate, global change, oceanography, things that are going to be affecting this disturbance regime, the timing of fall turnover. And we have this idea that maybe storms are going to become change in increased frequency, increased uh, uh, intensity, and change timing. How do we look? And this would, could affect things like fish distributions. And now I'm segueing a little bit into Dr. Nye's talk. But this is how we kind of look at it for black sea bass, as we would look at the Northeast Fish, Fishery Science Trawl Survey and the blue represents kind of more of the historical distribution. In the red, is, you can see them moving, creeping poleward, marching poleward, maybe marching a little bit offshore. And this is also depicted in this kind of uh, orientation over many, over decades, in terms of how these black sea bass are moving. They're in that upper red quadrant, so they're, they're marching poleward. And this is kind of a, a way that we're, I think we're getting lulled into complacency in a way. People are now talking about predictions with climate velocities. So we can make these kind of predictions of incremental changes in distributions. And from our, from Dave discovers the cold pool work, I think this is going to be different. I think we're going to be looking at distributional changes that reflect underlying modalities in uh, oceanography, 
and in its migration behavior. So if we have contingents, they can buffer populations against severe changes. But at some point, we may get an accelerated change. We may get an eruption associated with global change climate, global change oceanography. And so we, we have various ways of responding to these contingencies available to us as we discover new contingents. But one of our best responses to contingency remains uh, science to be conducted. So with that, I thank you very much. A couple of questions, if there are questions. I do have a question. Uh, so those last fish that hunkered, how many of them just died? And just, I mean, were they dead there, just lying around? Or? Oh no, no, they still moved around. Oh, they did. Yeah, yeah, we can tell when they died. But yeah, they 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 hunkered down, and then they eventually <laughs> undertook a offshore migration. All these fish will leave during the winter months. Yes? It, right near the end, you said that, that we might expect the shifts in fish distributions to be more abrupt than we involved in. Why do you think they would become more abrupt than they have been? Because I think we get this kind of buffering, that fish are resilient and they, they have some ability to withstand pressure. But at some point, they shift, and that shift can be dramatic. And also, we're moving into systems that are now what we might call novel ecosystems. And if you have these distribution shifts, some of these fish are basically moving into new ecosystems, and they show this kind of eruptive, invasive behavior that we see with invasives. But that's, that's kind of the idea behind it, anyway. My otolith chemistry of a fish that I'm pretty sure encountered a hurricane, Hurricane Bertha, a long time ago. Uh, so, our next speaker is Janet Nye. Janet is an associate professor at Stony Brook University in the uh, School of what is it, Marine and Atmospheric Sciences. And I first met Janet, I think, at a workshop in Gloucester or something, and I said, Who is this really smart person? Uh, and uh, then I started reading her papers, um, and she was doing work on tracking uh, how fish are moving because of climate change. And so I invited her to come and speak on that topic. So the, talk of, the title of her talk is The Future is Now, <clears throat> Climate Change and North Atlantic Fisheries. So we'll get you queued up. Thank you. Um, 